What's going on everyone? Welcome to another live oil painting session. So remember these streams for the time being will be 6.45 Monday and Wednesday Eastern Daylight Time. So for the first maybe minute or so, Hugo is going to be over there. He's going to say hello to you all. Hugo says hello. Um, but anyway, let's get into the painting now. Uh, what we did last time was we went in with palette knife and we mixed in the skin tones. Um, and I did say it would be like a minute. Now he's about to go. Um, he's about to go exploring. Uh, but anyway, so we went in with palette knife, mixed up the skin tone, and uh, tried to get the effect of a lead white type of look to it. Uh, so you you can see from at least this camera angle. We'll, we'll zoom in later on, but but you can see um, from where you are that it's pretty heavily painted in there. But I don't think it is completely dry. So to test that, I will run my palette knife. Oh, that's a shocker. It's actually dry. So that is a really weird thing that that has dried that fast. And it hasn't even been a whole week yet, which is quite surprising. All right, Hugo, come on. Come on, Hugo. All right. Quite surprising that it has dried that fast. Um, and that was what? Uh, last Wednesday, so Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, so we're the fifth day. Pretty thick paint from the palette knife. And it's not coming off. So if you want me to show you a close up before we get started, I'll go ahead and do that for you. And uh, in just a second here, um, so you can get an idea of how fast this dries. And the secret is I'm not using any extra medium. I'm not using a ton of water. Um, I'm just using enough water to thin out the paint. And even last time I didn't use any, any water at all. Uh, hardly any, I, I, I mean, when you see paint this thick, why would I have put water in it anyway? Ingrid. So as you see with the close up, and you can hear it. Doesn't sound good, I know, but just to prove a point that that did dry, um, that is faster than um, traditional oil paint if I were to paint that thick. Um, so the whole point is to emulate how Rembrandt painted that. Um, so anyway, now let's get back to the regular review here. Um, all right, so I have my mixing space has some paint from this morning. I was teaching a class this morning. So what I usually do is just scrape it, mix it up and then put it off to the side and then use this paint later on. By the way, I'm using Cobra Talons, which at this point shouldn't be differentiated uh, from traditional anymore. It's the same thing. It just it thins out with with water and it's easier to clean the brushes and and it doesn't sink in as much and it's all around easier to use um, than traditional. I'm just putting a little bit more white on there. All right, so let's just uh, pick up where we we left off and I'm going to start mixing some skin tones here. And as this is a live painting session, please feel free to ask any questions or just say hello. Uh, let me know where you're watching from. Does this schedule work out for you? Did you prefer the warnings? Uh, just let me know what's going on. I'm using the Cobra uh, colors. I'm using um, primary yellow deep. I think that's what it's called. I've said this yellow so many times and I don't know if I remember that. No, it's permanent yellow deep. I keep confusing them, but anyway. Uh, I've got three colors on my palette and I can't seem to remember them. Hmm. Uh, it's permanent yellow deep and uh, pyrrole red, ultramarine blue, titanium white, that's it. Uh, I mixed my orange and I mixed my green and my brown from these colors. So uh, yeah, it's just a three color palette, nothing special here, except for the fact that my red and my yellow are semi-transparent and my ultramarine blue is uh, fully transparent. 
So that ends up playing a role in the um, in the, the the resolve of the painting. But yeah, Cobra is drawing pretty fast. Um, very surprising. My first experiences with these uh, wasn't that. Um, well, they didn't dry that fast. Hey, Faye. Uh, thanks for watching from Kuwait. All right, so let's just paint a little spot here just to test it out. And it's pretty wild that five days later, this is dry enough for me to continue working on it. Um, absolutely wild. So let's get something in between these two. Perhaps a little darker. When you mix with palette knife, you, you do end up using a lot more paint. But the good news is you can, uh, like I did over there, you can save it. And why am I mixing with palette knife? I just want to have a thicker, thicker layer of paint. No other reason, just thicker layer of paint. All right, so let's get you your close up here so you can see the texture. This is the value that I'm currently mixing up there. Um, now someone commented last time and um, uh, my apologies, I, I just read it and I missed it. Um, the Rembrandt worked mainly in uh, thin glazes, I think that's what the comment was. And um, actually Rembrandt, from what I can see, if you zoom into the uh, the paintings that are like fully attributed to Rembrandt, uh, by the way, this is a Rembrandt study. Um, so if you zoom in, you can actually see the paint that he mixed. The brush still has some, hey Beanpot, uh, the brush still has some residue left from uh, previous mixtures. So if you take a little section here and you fill up your brush with it, for example, um, let's, let's emulate what Rembrandt would have done. So if you fill up your brush with this and you go to your painting and you put this thick crust of paint you can actually see some of the mixtures in between. So you can almost kind of picture that Rembrandt would go somewhat like this, fill up his brushes, which by the way, back in the 17th century, they didn't have filbert brushes. They actually had to tie up the, at least to my knowledge, I could totally be wrong with this. Um, they had to use handmade um, brushes, uh, but you can see it kind of like every single piece um, and I don't know why I'm using the brush if I'm trying to use the palette knife, but either way, it's a, it's a ton of paint, so there you go. That thick crust of the paint. Pretty fun to do. And I'm only imagining that the uh, original is this thick. The paint is that thick. And uh, the title of this stream is painting in all the details. Those of you that have been watching for a while, you know that I don't like the word details. Um, but I use the, de the word detail loosely um, in the sense that what I mean is I'm painting in the smaller shape. So for example, that little section right there, it was a kind of a swooping value. Um, and let's try it again over here. Fill up the brush, lots of paint. And just like last time, I really won't thin the paint out that much. And as you saw before, it thoroughly dried. I mean, thoroughly dried, without a doubt. So we'll fill in this little crust here. And I use the word crust by the sense of, in a, a very, um, in a friendly sense, Rembrandt paintings, if you, if you look at the texture, now I'm going to have to charge up the palette, the mixtures again, because I don't have lead white on my palette, uh, but I can mimic it by mixing with the palette knife. Um, so for those of you that don't know about lead white, um, and I apologize for those of you that do know, 
about it. I'm just going to repeat myself. Um, lead white is a lead-based white paint that was used in antiquity, definitely in the 17th century when Rembrandt was painting. Back then, they didn't have titanium white. They didn't have water mixable oil paints. They didn't have the modern chemistry that we have today, like cadmiums. Um, so lead white was a... Um, and, and what Rembrandt had was the Dutch process lead white. Again, go uh, feel free to correct me um, if you are a, a history history buff and you know a lot of um, 17th century um, classical art history pertaining Rembrandt. But the process was with coils of lead that was um, basically left to rot. And after it would rot, they would shake the coils and these flakes would come off, these uh, white flakes would come off and uh, they would get that, get those flakes and turn it into paint. That's where the term flake white comes from, if you didn't know. That's where the term flake white comes from. Um, and uh, the pigments, to the pigment of the flake white, the lead white, um, is such that it's a it's very irregular uh, from one pigment particle to the next unlike modern paint which is very uniform kind of like creaminess to it so um, the lead white that they had back then you could use a lot of it into your paint without raising your value too much so you could paint nice and thick values without raising the value too much nice and thick paint sorry uh, like say like this like that without raising the value too much but you have to be very careful see I messed that one up so I have to go with a palette knife and I have to make that value and paint it in quite thick so why am I trying to do this I don't know I just feel like it I feel like trying to emulate a lead white painting using um, the water mixable paint using titanium white um, and I do believe that you can achieve at least the look of it it's not gonna feel the same for those of you that have used um, lead white before but if you don't have uh, the uh, resources say like your own sink and access to like a, like a hazardous waste disposal and you can't use lead white then you're probably better off watching this video and trying to figure out how to emulate the lead white. Um, pretty fun process to create these thick mixtures with the palette knife. Um, the more you explore painting with the palette knife, the more you'll be able to achieve those thickly painted, uh, fun, lead white looking moments in a painting. So for example, I'm gonna have to make this transitioning plane with the uh, the palette knife and I could just pick all of it up with a brush and then add it on there but I'm just having fun with the palette knife um, maybe one of these days we'll just make a whole painting with the palette knife who knows um, so another nice thing about these paints is that I don't have to spend a ton of money remember I only buy three colors and I pre-mix my secondary colors and my one tertiary color which is the brown um, so it saves you quite a lot of money um, as you saw it dried pretty quickly um, it doesn't sink in all that much this is actually something a little bit I can tell but it's nothing major nothing like traditional oil paint when it sinks in and you have to apply medium to it um, so in that regard it's a lot easier uh, to use. So let's go ahead and test this value out. And I should have gave the warning out earlier in the stream. When we get into, say, the details uh, of a painting, not a lot of stuff happens in a long period of time, especially when I'm over here talking. Um, so please Feel free to ask any art-related questions you have, um, just to keep the stream more entertaining for uh, some folks that may be watching this after um, 
after the stream has ended. Now, if you're interested in um, painting with palette knife, I would suggest getting these palette knives with the brown handle. You can find them on Amazon, on Jerry's, Jackson's, pretty much everywhere. Actually, I don't know about Jackson's, but I'm assuming they have it there. Um, I would not use the Liquitex um, palette knife because that's kind of like a butter knife. It's a very uh, unforgiving, let's just put it that way, very unforgiving. Um, and it doesn't f uh, have flex flexibility that like this one has. See, I don't, I don't have to press that hard. The more you use it, um, the more flexible the metal becomes. But if you start off with a uh, really like really stiff palette knife, it, it, you're really not going to make it get that much uh, looser on you. It's also just a fun, fun thing to do to mix all this paint. And uh, I'll show you how to get soft edges with it. It's not all that difficult, but it does take um, it, it takes a little more effort than with a paintbrush. So what I do is I kind of, I use the point of the palette knife, the, the, the tip of the palette knife. And this is why I like it to be round. Um, it's round like a filbert, as you see here. It's rounded off similar to a filbert uh, so that it gives me more control uh, to use the tip of the palette knife to round things off. So what I do is I swirl the paint around and I go and uh, I apply spin. Kind of like in pool, I always refer to pool. I'm applying side spin or uh, they would call English. Um, I'm, I'm spinning uh, the uh, palette knife. So what it's doing is it's making a little fine mixture here and it creates a gradation. Just like on the Rembrandt, you see a, a nice gradation for that eye. And, uh, and you can achieve that gradation with the palette knife too. And uh, the positive side of doing that with a palette knife is that it's going to be thick. I mean, it's going to be crusty paint. Um, and that's what you want if you want to get the lead white look. So yes, it's a, it does take more from you to be able to mix these colors that precisely with the palette knife. Um, Angry, I can do a full portrait with a palette knife. I'm sure I can. It's just I'm just wondering how much paint I'm gonna go through. To be honest, um, that would be a very expensive painting. Um, as you see here in the mixing space, there's a ton of paint. And um, all the leftover that I have from it, I'm probably gonna have to use to tone a bunch of canvases. Um, but yeah, I like the idea. It's definitely something I could look, look into. Let's see. Hey, well, I'm glad you like the crusty. Uh, yeah, there's lots of crust in there, and it, it does add a nice lead white look, uh, we'll say. Hey, Erfa. Uh, I wish. Uh, so, my family is from Peru, but I was born and raised in um, Maryland, USA. So, my, my Spanish is not very good. I only spoke it with my my grandparents. Uh, let's see, what's the most I can say in Spanish about painting? Um, now I'm gonna sound like a fool. Uh, let's see. Lo más importante de estos pinturas cobras son que um, no cuesta mucho dinero y uh, cuando seca, no se pone todo blanco. But I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to say when it dries, it doesn't doesn't fade. As you see, my, my Spanish is not very good. Um, hey, well, 
Uh, so you're saying it would be hard to scrub the darks in with a palette knife? Mm, uh, maybe, maybe not. I mean, yes, you're correct. The darks need to be thin. So in that respect, yes, it would be a little more difficult, um, but it's possible. So for example, if I want to go from, let's take a look here. Uh, if I want to go from, say, uh, here to here. See, I, this is too thick. Um, so if I want to correct that part, of the painting let's let's see how hard it is to do because i think you're right it, it is going to be difficult but and, and this is not an area that you want to have a lot of texture so um how would you add those details in with a palette knife and not have it be ultra thick well we'll find out um my theory is that um it's gonna be due to uh more of the way you apply the paint uh, so let's test this this value out let's get you up close okay so this is what I mean by the way you apply the paint and I'll change the light sensitivity so you can see what I'm talking about and it's gonna be really magnified so you can see the dark um, so you see this dark brown, and I'm pushing the brown a little bit more because in the picture, I'm sure it would, in real life, I'm sure that it would be more brown than it is in the in the image. So if I want this to be a thin coat, see how I'm kind of scratching at it a little bit? You see that? Okay, next, what I'm gonna do is go back to the palette and um, Oh, thanks for asking that question. Um, let's see if I can answer this one while we're in the middle of this. Um, oh, someone, Maria, said, No, mi español es terrible, terrible. Um, uh, but thanks, Maria. Uh, let's see, Nicole, uh, forgive me for asking questions uh, you may have already covered. How do you transition colors from the side of the face into the light side of the face in the shadow color slash temperature wise? Oh, good question at the right time. Uh, you know, no need to apologize, really. Um, ask any questions you have, um, any painting related questions. You know, the more questions you ask, the better it is for me uh, for the live streams in the sense that uh, it, it gets more publicity on YouTube. Um, so uh, so yeah, let's let's see. So I deliberately just put in some green into this mixture, um, and once again, that green is just a green that I I made up from my uh, three primaries. So you see here, this value is lighter than this one deliberately. So now, in order to go from the dark into the light, see how I'm adding some paint to the front of the palette and I'm gonna have to go and very carefully apply this plane change right here and uh, and now we're gonna test how difficult it is to move from the dark into the light and when it comes to the temperature change Nicole um, I applied kind of a, a reddish into the facial hair and then applied a greenish color going around the lips uh, applying a greenish color to that section is is, is kind of a um, uh, a safe bet uh, because typically painters surround warm things uh, such as um, so such as like the the nose the eyelids the lips for example are usually surrounded by cooler colors like you'll see here a lot of portrait painters put cooler colors here a lot of portrait painters put cooler colors. Around here, a lot of portrait painters put cooler colors. Um, so um, it's a convention, really, to, to put the cooler colors. You can go blue, you can go green. Um, I decided to use green for that. Uh, so now, let's see how I'm going to spin the palette knife. I'm using the edge of it. And I'm applying these details, but at the same time, I'm also applying a thicker layer of paint. Uh, so the thicker layer of paint is definitely... Um, not easy to achieve in the darks um, just as you uh, asked uh, well now to go from here into here I'm gonna have to add a slightly lighter 
value, but not that much lighter. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just go right into here. And uh, when you're working with a palette knife, you wanna be sure of your value before you put it down. So there I can see it pretty clear. And I know that it's going to be much lighter, which is gonna create this plane change that I want. And now I can kind of swirl it in. And it's gonna look very close to this light. So it's gonna be a little, a little challenging to get that transition. See how I'm scraping that in there? So I'm going to use the paint to basically um, almost like a filling in a hole in a wall, um, adding like plaster to it. Now I'm adding some darker paint. See that? Kind of like a plaster um, in a wall. See how I'm using the, the tip of the palette knife to scrape this in there? And there it is. That's the transition that I was talking about. It is possible with palette knife, but it is a lot harder to achieve those um, those smooth transitions. So that's just as smooth as something you can get with a really fine brush. Not easy though, it's it's not not easy at all. I doubt Rembrandt used a palette knife for that. He most likely used a brush. No oh, thanks, well, I'm glad that you like the, um, the techniques with palette knife. Actually, my first um, teacher was a Henry Henschey student, um, or should, I should say is a Henry Henschey student, and um, they are lifetime, we are lifetime students of whichever school of painting we uh, are brought up in. Um, but anyway, it, we did color studies of uh, different still life objects under uh, different, like morning light, afternoon light, evening light, um, mainly morning light though. And uh, we would do those still life studies and palette knife. So I got a lot of experience when I was really young working with palette knife. And then I de detested it and I didn't use it for a pretty long time. And then um, I got back into doing color study when I was teaching it to my students. Um, and then I learned how to use it in my, uh, my studio paintings uh, years ago. Um, so basically, any tool that you can get is a good thing. Um, the more tools you add to your um, to your repertoire, the more complete of, of a painter you will be. So see, I'm doing it again. In order to get that soft edge, I'm spinning the palette knife. So we're gonna get this gradation here, and I actually attribute this to my uh, teacher Paul. Then I've seen I've seen him do this many times, where he would spin the palette knife, and he would get a really smooth transition, almost like like a transition that was glazed. So a lot of this is actually mixing in the paint, I'm mixing the paint in the painting. See how I just raised the value there? So it's mixing as I go. No reason for me to use palette knife other than I really want the thickness of the paint. See that? You can see the paint crust, the crustiness. Uh, your stuffed crust um, used to be $19.99 from, I think it was Pizza Hut. Now it's like $30 or something. It's crazy. Um, Inflation, right? Is there any other tools that you recommend other than brushes or palette knives for a portrait or landscape? Um, you could use a fan brush, um, something like this to um, knock down the paint a little bit uh, to make it less heavy. Um, if you have a fancy wooden palette you don't want to scratch up, you can use this, uh, which is a, it's a Princeton Catalyst uh, knife. I'll show you it's pretty much the same thing. Um, I can use the point but you see it's not rounded so it's gonna be a little more jagged. Um, 
So you can use this and do the same kind of thing. And spin it. And um, I, I bought this a long time ago because I didn't want to scratch up my, my fancy wooden palette. And I actually use this to teach uh, color study. Yeah, the stuffed crust, you know it. Okay, so see what I mean? Um, I can use it to spin it around. Kind of like pull, apply side spin. And there it is. You see that very careful transition? And that was done with a palette knife. And even here, there's a lot of careful transitions that we need to address. So let's address them. What I'm gonna do is go in with the dark first. Now here's where I have to really, I have to think because I can't just apply the paint anymore like I did with the, with the knife. I actually have to turn it because it's a chisel. It's a chisel looking thing. So this is harder to use, but it won't scratch up your fancy wooden palette if you have a fancy wooden palette that you care about. And to be honest, it's a, not a smart thing. Um, your palette should be, you should be able to do whatever you want to that palette. Mix on the palette with a knife. Don't worry about scratching it up. Uh, put it in the freezer, drop it, uh, spill Diet Coke on it, whatever. Uh, accidentally drop your stuffed crust on the palette knife. Uh, you should be able to, I mean, drop it on your palette. You should be able to do anything you want. Um, so don't be careful. Don't be too overly careful with your materials. That would be one of my biggest pieces of advice. Uh, if you're too, if you find that you're too careful with your materials, then you should you should definitely change your mindset uh, with the materials. So I'm going in with this dark first. Yeah, I know I want some pizza now too. Actually, you know what, I got some pizza bites in the freezer. Okay, so what I want you to see with the palette knife is I can get, like I said, this is a detail in, in the sense of the word detail, but it's it's a form. So this form, and we're gonna get into the dark dark soon, but it's a form that has a specific value in relation to the shadow. And it, it's going, it, we're going to get all these pieces together and we're gonna apply um, Parmesan cheese to it, like right here. And then we're gonna make sure to set the oven at 425 for 17 minutes. And then it's gonna slightly rise a little bit more there. Um, that's what we're gonna do. No thanks, Will. Um, so let's move the crust over here. Knead the crust a little bit forward so we can get that perfect shape. Now that's the, on a more serious note, that that's going to be the point where light terminates and shadow begins. Right there. So I could have started this painting off with a very careful drawing and I would have had that already figured out in the first like 20 minutes. Um, but I went in with color and trusted that I would come back to it just like we're doing now and figure out all the difficult stuff um, with the drawing, which is what I call the details. So now we're gonna go back over here. I'm gonna try to mix that up and uh, we'll stick with this little putty knife thing. See if we can get that value. So um, the ultramarine is full transparent and the, the pyrrole red, my red is um, semi-transparent. So the semi-transparentness of the uh, the red 
allows me to not overtake the darkness of the ultramarine blue and create a nice dark. You see how dark that gets? So this leans a little bit towards the, I'd say brown, the reddish brown. So let's go in. Another nice thing about this little putty thing um, is it doesn't make a palette knife sound. So if you're sensitive to the sound of the palette knife, then this would be a better option for you, but it is not easier to use. In fact, it's a lot harder to use um, than the palette knife, but I'm just, just using it because I feel like it. Um, I don't have to use it, but why not? Okay, you see how dark that gets? And now you can see I have a long ways to go um, with my darks. I thinned it out so this was naturally going to occur. It does sink in a little bit, but it doesn't sink in enough that it's going to look lighter here than that, which is something that can happen with, um, with, with oil paints, but not with these. Give him his sideburns. Hey, Kona Ryder. Oh, thank you, thank you. So all this talking and it's already been 30 something minutes. Um, so hopefully you, what you get out of this is a very astonishing discovery that the Cobra did dry uh, in five days um, and that you can create a lead white look with Cobra using titanium white instead of lead white because of course if you're going to use water mixable you're probably not going to want to use anything with lead anyway right uh, and here I'm going to spin it remember apply a side spin to the cue ball so I'm applying a little bit of spin, <laughs> like I'm spinning the, the palette knife literally, to create a soft transition right there, um, a, a soft edge. See that? Now it's a nice and loose soft edge. Okay, so now this starts to become dimensional. It starts to look like a thing that is in real space as opposed to just um, kind of like a cartoon thing. A oh, good, good question from Ingrid. Everyone, what paints are you using? Um, what paints are you currently using? And we've got, what, about 17 of us here, so hopefully we'll have... 17 answers and uh, and if you're new to it all and you're not painting yet, yeah, just let me know. It's, it's all good We're glad to have you here I'm gonna mix kind of a greenish cast shadow from the hair then I'll, then we'll get to the details of the eye socket. I'm getting a little distracted with the with these planes. So I have to mix every single value here or spin, apply a side spin like this. And even when I'm doing that, I'm actually mixing the paint anyway. See that? Apply a side spin. And it creates its own value. And it's thick, it's a thickly painted thing. So we get the crust.
See, I've added a little bit of green to it even. Anything we can do to get the crust and get some nice color nuances to it. Now here's the test. If we can get the thickness in the darks, that will definitely look like a, a lead white painting. Uh, so from Wiley Windsor Newton, the only ones you've tried since you're just beginning. No worries, no worries. Uh, I mean, Nelson Shanks used Windsor Newton and he was the most prominent portrait painter in the 20th century, so no, no issues there. I'd say he was one of the best. I'd say top, top three, that's in my opinion. But it's just an opinion. Hey Nicole, currently gouache, uh, gouache, 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 gouache. I can't pronounce things. Gouache, cool. I will admit I've never used gouache. Nice and thick texture. In fact, this was one of the only things that I wasn't able to do with uh, Cobras. So I'm glad that I was uh, somewhat brave or silly enough to try to tackle it. That was the one thing, that was the missing piece. So what you wrote, what do you think about different brands? Sorry if you already talked about that. Um, so let's see. Um, so different brands of oil paint. Uh, well, yeah, I've tried a lot of different brands. Um, so I'd say um, the best, the the most reliable ones for for traditional are going to be Winsor Newton and Gamblin. Those are gonna be the most reliable. Um, not super expensive and great quality. Uh, artist grade paints. Excellent variety of color as well. Um, in fact, when I was a student at a studio in Kamenati, like a decade or so, more than a decade ago now, um, most of those paints we had like a 22 color palette for color study. Most of those paints were either Gamblin or Winsor Newton. Um, so very nice. Now when you're talking about the authenticity, so for example, if if you find yourself wanting to use the colors that Rembrandt himself used, the same type of colors, um, Rublev, um, a brand called uh, Natural Pigments makes these uh, paints called Rublev and um, very high quality paints and you can achieve effects like this much uh, with uh, uh, less effort um, with those paints. Um, they don't have any any um, binders in the in the paint or whatever it's called. Basically they don't they, it's like buying organic fruit or organic vegetables. That's what Rublev is. It's like buying organic in the sense that there's nothing in it that's going to protect it. So you better darn use it um, before it goes bad. Um, by going bad, I mean it can um, dry in the, in the tube, which can be an issue. Uh, however, the paints are really authentic. Um, I've used them before. I, I I really like the feel of them. Um, Williamsburg oil paints are um, also very kind of traditional, and they are cheaper than Rublev, cheaper than Old Holland. Um, I I like the color variety that Williamsburg has. It's pretty much on par with Michael Harding. Michael Harding is. Um, about kind of the same as Williamsburg, in my opinion. They're more affordable than like Old Holland and Rublev, uh, but they also have really good quality of 
like it feels like handmade paint, but nothing really is like Rublev. Rublev uh, is definitely like your uh, old master's go-to kind of uh, if you want to use the uh, oldest of the oldest pigments. That's Rublev. Um, other brands like Water Mixable over here we're using Cobra Talons which is what you're seeing me use here and it's what I've been using for almost a year now um, really high quality colors uh, very pigmented as uh, Ingrid would say um, I like the word pigmented um, strong colors they dry at a pretty reasonable rate on par with traditional if not faster than traditional takes a while to get used to because the paint flow is not that similar to like Rublev. Um, it's it's more creamy than Rublev. Um, it's it's on par with maybe like a like a Winsor Newton or a Gamblin um, in terms of the creaminess of it. Um, they do not have a lead white, so you're going to have to um, do some kind of stuff like this to be able to get. Uh, the, uh, the lead white look to your to your paintings um, so it does take more effort but you don't have to worry about the, um, the cleanup it's a very simple to clean your brushes with the Cobras um, other paints that I've tried in the past are um, uh, believe it or not the Plaza brand if you uh, have a Plaza near you They've got pretty cheap paints. I mean, they're really cheap. Um, kind of like buying like the the grocery store brand, uh, the generic brand, basically. Um, they're pretty good. The only problem I had was the uh, it's just the color variety is not very good. Um, and I think that's all I know. Um, that's all I can think of, really. Probably a lot of information. Um, I tend to talk a lot about paint um, or pool. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, any, any questions you have about materials, definitely let me know. I, I, can, I can tell you everything I know, um, which isn't a lot. I don't know that much, but I, I do have like over a decade of experience with this. So well, you wrote, um, do you know if authentic paints like Rublev are more toxic? Well, it depends on the pigment. Um, so, for example, if you're going to use... Uh, uh, the, the most toxic paint of them all is going to be um, an arsenic yellow. Um, so, it, it has arsenic in it. Um, so, if you accidentally ingest that, you're ingesting arsenic. Um, not a good thing. Uh, lead white, if you ingest the lead white, um, you're ingesting lead. Um, it's, yeah, so they're all really not toxic as long as you keep them away from kids, keep them away from pets. I know that you're not going to eat the paint. Like, I know that you're not going to do that, right? Um, but accidents happen. Um, my puppy bumped into one of my paintings once and it was cobra of course so i just put him in the bathtub and i was able to to help him out um if it was i don't know like lead white toned the canvas and it was still wet and he had a bunch of lead white on his on his uh tail i would probably explode um so that's where the toxicity really uh, becomes a thing. However, if you have access to a studio where your pet Shiba Inu is not going to be running wild, you have no issues at all with using any type of paint. Um, because as long as you're not uh, exposed to the particles, meaning um, as long as you're not sanding a painting, um, you're not going to be exposed to the pigments. That's the toxic thing. It's the pigments. Um, also, the air quality with, like, solvents and stuff like that. Um, but if you have an open window or in good ventilation, you really won't have any problems. I assure you, you could paint with 
lead white, um, arsenic yellow, mercury red, um, and then your basic like lapis lazuli or whatever, like all those genuine colors. Uh, a lead yellow would be like a Naples yellow, a lead tin yellow, lead everything, lead primed canvas, whatever. Um, and you'll be fine. You'll be totally fine as long as you don't um, you don't accidentally get the paint on something or uh, as long as there are no accidents, you'll be totally fine. I once heard a horror story of someone at a workshop that decided to put their mineral spirits in a in a water bottle and you can guess what happened. Um, they had to be rushed to the hospital and it was really annoying because they, they were on a trip um, in Italy or something. Well, they were taking a workshop in Italy or something. So uh, they burned like a hole through their insides or whatever it was. I'm terrible at telling stories, by the way. Um, but it has a happy ending. They, they recovered. They were, they were all right. Uh, it just wasn't a good idea to take a huge gulp of it. Um, so yeah, uh, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. Um, hey, well, I'm glad you're learning a lot. Good, good. Uh, we'll be here every Monday and Wednesday. Um, so Ingrid wrote, hold my hand water. Solubles are highly pigmented and professional. They have thicker consistency. Yeah, I haven't tried those. Uh, also the Lucas, right? Um, Lucas is on sale on uh, Jerry's, so I'll, I'll probably check out the Lucas. Um, so now I'm mixing the dark light here again with this palette knife. Again, a thicker consistency of paint than I would get with a paintbrush. Very difficult edge, by the way. This is the hardest edge in all of painting. Uh, the, the dark lights, the value as light transitions uh, into shadow. It being fought, yeah, I imagine that hurt. Um, that must have not been pleasant. Let's go into the green. Adding some more green and see how I'm applying some side spin. I'm spinning this so that it mixes with the layer there and, and even, even the slightest little dark I can get. See this little piece adding a little bit of paint and then swirling it around and then we have a smooth transition that's thickly painted. That's the thing, it's thickly painted. Okay, so let's continue to add some more intricacies. I don't know if this is the right value, so I'm going to test it first. Could get a little darker. Hey, well, oh, thank you. I'm glad you like the shadow under his pupil. It is, a little, yeah, you're right. It is difficult finding the right color um, for painting the eyelids. It, it is a bit of a challenge. Um, usually, it helps to go a little more pink with it. But not like a reddish pink. So again, thick paint. Lots of crust, even in the underplanes here. And these are all the little details that I was talking about. Now that's thick. A 
I've deposited a little more green there. Well, this entire time I've been using that like soft. If you want me to switch to the regular palette light, palette knife, let me know. Let's see how I'm using the point. You can absolutely use the palette knife for uh, Rembrandt looking stuff. Hey Tipo, welcome, welcome. Now, let's go ahead and add some subtlety to the nose. A little more red. Make a pinkish color. Load up this palette knife thing. Nice film to it. Probably going to be the incorrect value, but let's try it. Let's try it out first. That actually works pretty good. Thickly painted. Incredibly thick. Hey, Beanpot, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, this is not ideal, um, but it is very flexible. Um, it is um, a kind of, uh, I don't know what they call them, but you can, you can see, you can read it there, Princeton Catalyst. Uh, I think this is like a, I don't know, I don't remember what they call them, but um, I, I bought it a while ago because I didn't want to mess up my fancy palette knife. Uh, but I, I prefer this shape. Because it's like a filbert. Um, filbert allows me to have more control. So, for example, like this is going to be much easier now going into that uh, transition. And watch me mess it up as soon as I say that. Um, see, I, I can mix with the the tip of it. I, well, I don't have to mix with the tip, but applying the paint on the tip of the palette knife is going to allow me to have more precision and um, still be able to deposit a, a big amount of paint. See, the, the value is a little dark, but it's actually better to go dark because I can add light into dark. And I'll show you what I mean. So this is why the round is easier. See how I can apply the paint just like a paintbrush now? Instead of having to carefully like move this thing around. Um, this is much, much easier because it gives me more of a feel like a paintbrush. And look at this, watch this. I can just dig into this mixture, not even fully mix it yet. And just let it mix in here. To create, see that right there? To create that rounded shape. And still have the nice crust. The stuffed crust, uh, $30 pizzas thanks to inflation. Um, uh, so allows me to have that uh, consistency. And it's a nice feeling when you layer palette knife over palette knife. I really have, I don't think I've ever done that with a portrait painting, to be honest. Hey, Beanpot, oh good, I'm glad you liked the explanation. Yeah, more dexterity. Now that's starting to round out. Um, definitely more than the Rembrandt, so I should make it a little less round. So I'm gonna go back to the plane on the nose. Should be a little lighter anyway. A little bit more pink. That's probably gonna to be too pink, so let's mix it with this.
So a little different. Um, I could hold it like this, like a paintbrush if I want to. But with a palette knife, since it's a little more difficult anyway, I, I tend to hold it closer. Almost, you see here, to the point where I get paint on my hands. You can see how crusty the paint layer is. Now we'll adjust the nostril. And uh, this semi-transparent red allows me to have access to more of a madder lake or a lizard crimson looking color without actually having a lizard on my palette. I need a tad bit more paint. So this is an area where I really don't need to have very thick paint. But we're going to do it anyway, why not? Now I kept my promise from the beginning. I did tell you, I warned you, not a lot of stuff is gonna happen in a long period of time. I heard a really nice um, uh, conversation that somebody was having, and this was in the, the pool room, about when you learn something in the beginning, the progress is rapid, uh, and you make big strides pretty fast. Um, uh, for example, in, in pool, you learn pretty much how to pocket, like, three balls consecutively in, like, I don't know, like, a couple months or something. Um, you learn how to draw the cue ball back in, like, a week. Like, progress is pretty fast. Uh, I think he, I don't know, what it, I think it was called the law of diminishing returns or something. Um, so the more you do it, the more advanced you become in anything, uh, the more time it takes to see an improvement. Uh, so you have to have a little more patience. Um, but that is also true in a painting. In the beginning of a painting, everything happens so fast. Um, it develops so quickly um, because it's everything is just shapes of light and dark. Once you get into the subtlety of things like this, um, it doesn't happen rapidly anymore. Things actually take a long time. It, it doesn't occur as fast as it did earlier on. It takes more patience. Um, but the patience is something that you can build. And if you can somehow make it through this entire YouTube video, then your patience is, is already... Um, increased so I'm applying a side plane to that now Absolutely one of the best pieces of advice I can give you is don't don't stress out about the materials. Um, just because I'm using Cobra Talons doesn't mean that Cobra Talons is going to be uh, the right thing for you to use. If you have access to a sink uh, that you can dedicate for art, uh, then you don't need Cobra Talons. Unless you really want to use it, um, and that's fine. Now, if you don't have access to your own sink, if you don't have access to a hazardous waste disposal, uh, maybe you have a newborn child, or you live in a one-bedroom apartment, or you have a puppy, um, and you can't have uh, the toxicity of things 
um, lead to potential accidents, then Cobra is your solution. Yeah, and now I'm actually going to be um, tutoring uh, students that requested um, techniques solely based on COBRA. Um, I have some new students that are really, really interested in uh, improving their COBRA painting uh, abilities. So I'm, I'm most likely not the only instructor on the internet that teaches uh, traditional and water mixable, but I may be one of the only ones that I know of <laughs> um, that is using strictly cobra, period. Um, like I said before, I, at a certain point, it's pretty much all the same, really. What matters is what you're putting down, not what you're using to put it down, not what you're using to put the value down. So don't get caught up in um, thinking that the material is going to is going to make you improve. It will make it easier for you to improve, but you actually have to put in the hard work to improve. Now I'll put in some uh, planes in the facial hair. So that was a dark kind of greenish. All right, so another question for everyone. We've got, still got about 17 of us here. Um, um, just for fun, um, do any of you have any pets? Do you have dogs, cats, tarantulas, boa constrictors, um, rabbits, hamsters, guinea pigs, turtles, tortoises, bearded dragon, crested geckos, do you have any pets? This has to be a dark greenish. So be part uh your so Tipu, no pets. Um, Beanpot wrote no, but thinking of getting a cat. Awesome, awesome. Tipu wrote had a rabbit, guinea pig, and turtle. Oh, cool. Nicole, you have a cat, dog, and a, what's that? A snail. Oh, cool. Tipu, let's see. Uh, and lots of fish. Awesome. Yeah, aquatics take a lot of work. I remember. Um, yeah, aquatic. Any, anything with a fish tank, so much work. I'm applying the skin tone and this light grayish warm color. Painting thick even on the facial hair. It's 
Uh, anyone else? Anyone got any pets? Furry friends or reptiles? Yeah, so I definitely made his facial hair a bit too thick, but I don't mind. Hey Juan, thanks for watching from Chile. Oh, thank you. I'm glad that you enjoy my tutorials. Yeah, so a uh, new schedule. I'll be here every Monday and Wednesday around this time. Yeah, this time it's really, really different. Um, I'm painting really thick. Uh, with a palette knife to create the look of a uh, lead white painting. It was one of the last things that I couldn't do or didn't do yet uh, with Cobra. I need that soft transition because facial hair you want to be very careful that it doesn't look like it was done with a sharpie. Um, that would be pretty bad. Again, I'm not afraid for it to look a little irregular. As long as it doesn't look like a line that was made with a sharpie, or you know, like those, those uh, somebody goes to the Mona Lisa and draws a mustache. You know, I've been wanting to do that for a while. Uh, <laughs> maybe like April Fools, get one of my paintings and draw a mustache on it with a sharpie. Uh, if somebody super chats me like a hundred, I'll do it. Um, just because why not? <laughs> so that'd be kind of funny. As you can tell, I like to uh, enjoy life. See, with the palette knife, it can create kind of like a, bar a brush stroke look. Now the planes of the hair for the facial hair. You know, I really didn't expect to do all these details with a palette knife today, everyone. I didn't expect that I would do that. So let me know what you think. If the palette knife bothers you, let me know. I once met um, someone that only used palette knife and didn't know how to use paintbrushes. So it's not all that rare to use a palette knife. It's just rare for portraits. Okay, so let's go back to the color. Color mixing. And the next thing, I keep coming back to the contour of that eye. So I can cheat it a little bit and scrape into the dry paint like that. See that? Another palette knife trick to create a soft edge. I'm literally just digging into the into the paint. Hey Beanpot, so you've always liked a palette knife. 
look but never been able to control it well. Oh, you'll be able to. If you're really interested in it, you'll be able to control it. Really, the only thing that's difficult with palette knife in comparison to not palette knife um, is the edges. Uh, soft edges are hard with palette knife. Um, but if you have the right knife, like, um, next time I'll, I'll create a link to this palette knife. Um, we can also find it on Amazon. Just look for those brown handled ones. Um, not the liquid Tex. I have nothing against the liquid Tex. They make really great gesso. Um, but their palette knives are really, really difficult to paint with. They're only really used for um, cleaning a palette. Uh, they're literally like butter knives. Um, but yeah, they're, they're easier to use than others. And again, I, I was lucky. My first teacher had one of these, so I, I already knew from when I was in high school about these palette knives. Palette knife also really forces you to mix the paint. Because when you're not mixing on the palette, you're mixing on the painting. But I, I understand your, what you're saying. I also struggle with uh, controlling the palette knife, which is why I haven't done a full painting with palette knife. But I like the challenge, I might, I might do that next. Why don't we try to paint a Rembrandt with palette knife? See how that goes. Okay, so here's where a palette knife can get real difficult. I have to mix into the paint because it's really hard for me to figure out the precise value for this shape. Right in that little spot there to get the curvature of his nose. But I think I got it. Like I said, I can cheat it. Um, if I don't want to mix this, although I should, uh, I can cheat it by scratching it because there is a layer underneath. So see that transition, smooth transition, effortless transition. Uh, of course it wasn't effortless. I actually just made that up <laughs> to be honest, the scratching part, um, but it works. If it works, it works. Add some more yellow. What I like is that this is getting uh, thicker. This could be a really thick painting. By the way, I will be selling these paintings um, in these live streams. Um, maybe not during the stream or maybe during the stream, I don't know. Audience is not quite, uh, our attendance is not big enough for me to have a sale during a stream like we used to back in 2020, but once our numbers go up, we'll be selling these.
case you want to see what this looks like in person. You know what's funny is if you only paint with palette knife, you don't need um, any solvent. So that would be a way for you to paint without having to worry about the mineral spirits. Just something to think about. Not that you need to use it, like I said. Now that is a lead white looking highlight. It just requires a lot more paint to create that look. Now nothing can emulate the translucency that lead white has when you look really close into it. So all of the things that I'm telling you about emulating what lead white looks like is from afar. Um, but when you get close into it, you'll be able to tell um, that it was titanium and not lead. Uh, but from a distance, you will see um, that, that thick layer of paint. And we'll adjust this value here, and I think that'll probably be the last thing that we do. Um, then we'll come back to it and add more subtlety. And I'll be back on Wednesday, same time, 6.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. should be good actually I don't like this line I'm gonna go into that um, fix that little line there um, so Nicole you wrote let's see it's amazing to see how you controlled your color um, do you organize the colors such values to progress down the palette as it does down the face or is it natural for you I lose values on my palette well um, I try to have a gradation from light to dark. Yes, you're correct. Um, I, uh, when I teach this to my students, I usually call it a, either a string or a color value web, but just something to control your value range. So your brain automatically knows like light, okay, I'm going here. Dark, I'm going here. Uh, somewhere in the middle, I'm going here. And then here, there's something warm here there's greenish, um, so I have, I have it kind of organized in that way. Um, it's it's not automatic for me. I had to actually implement that in my in my um, in my uh, technique years ago. Uh, but you can do it. You can, and what will help is to just start every painting, uh, every portrait painting. Just start mixing up your. Just do some test mixtures, test strings, I guess, um, of, uh, of value. And you don't necessarily have to use them, but just know that that's the area where that value is going to live.
Yeah, no problem, Nicole. All right, so we've got that down. Cool. All right, so that should be it with that. As always, uh, let me know if you have any last minute questions. I'll hang out for a little bit. I'll be here on Wednesday, same time. That is 6.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So hopefully um, better for those of you that uh, uh, are working during the day and are home in the evening in the uh, U.S. and in other countries as well. I apologize for those of you that's probably really late. Um, I, I, I wish I could um, use quantum mechanics and do this at, at different times of the day. Oh, no problem, Will. Thank you for watching. I'm glad you enjoy. Yep, so any last minute questions? Of course, I'll be here with, with Hugo. The Shiba Inu. <laughs> and of course, Hugo is on his pool table. I don't think he'll, well, he might play pool, but he's just going to say hi. He's going to say hi. Say, say hello. Say hello. Say hello to everyone. Are you shy? Are you shy? Are you shy, Hugo? No? No? You're not shy? Okay. All right. Do you want do you want a lift? Do you need a lift? Do you need a lift? Oh, I think he needs a lift. All right. I guess you've got a lift here. Uh, Uber Express Upari, I guess. Oh. All right. Come over here, buddy. There you go. <laughs> That's my Shiba. That is my Shiba. Hugo. Hugo says thanks everyone for watching. As always, we will be back same time Monday and Wednesday for the foreseeable future. 6.45 p.m. Eastern and Daylight Time as always. And Hugo says if you want to take your art education with Upari further, links for his Patreon are in the description box of the video. Hugo and I say thanks for watching. We shall see you on the next one. Oh, thanks, Maria. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone again. Um, so, so yeah, to, to go back to, to reality, I will be here for the foreseeable future, Mondays and Wednesdays, 6.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Links to my Patreon is in the description box of the video if you're interested in the online classes. I mean, if you want to know more information about them, just, just let me know. We could we could talk on Zoom or whatever. Just um, go through what you would like to learn with me. Um, just be great to get to know you. And again, uh, please share these videos. Uh, let's help to bring our numbers back to what they used to be back in 2020. Again, I wish you all the very best. And I'll see you 
on the next one.